like, well, what have I learned? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's learning, but it's a thought that um, as I get older, I'm more aware of my 20s uh, as being present with me now. And I don't hold them in some kind of nostalgic regard that would be foolish. I just mean, I can feel that. I can feel the mysterious continuity in a person's life, for example, my own, uh, between who one was at age eight or 18 or 28 and who one is now. And I think Helen's pictures, though I don't talk about this in the book, I think they're aware of something like this too, that we composite, we categorize our life into different stages. And of course that makes sense, but in another more mysterious sense, we're always the same or we're always, all of our experiences, the sum of our sensations are always at play in us. So when you um, structured this book, you structured it um, as one decade and each chapter as one starts with one day in a year during the decade. How did, what made you um, decide to go in that direction? I think it was Helen's paintings themselves because of their, um, their feeling of, of spontaneity, of immediacy, of catching life on the wing. It just made it apparent to me that I should tell her story in terms of individual days uh, because you know she's really portraying a day on earth. And so, um, this structure of this book was always apparent to me that it should proceed in this fashion. And I knew the beginning day and I knew the ending day. I didn't know all the other days, but uh, it would be one day a year and it's related to the way the paintings feel to me. Mm -hmm. And of course the paintings are all in the retrospective, which is at the end. Uh, yes, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just seeing if there's any questions. So um, many people who are listening won't have read your book yet. So maybe it would be helpful for them to hear a little bit about how you um, came to doing this book. What was yeah. it in her work that engaged yeah, you? I, yeah, you know, I, I was um, in the Milwaukee Art Museum in 2016 and uh, I was looking at this painting by Helen, the very painting I just read a passage about called Hotel Cro-Magnon. And I noticed that I spend more time in front of that painting than I did in front of all the other pictures in the whole museum combined. Mm -hmm. And I thought this was so interesting to me that this would be the case. And obviously I knew about Helen's work before, but there's something that really held me. And you know what I think it was? It was uh, just a feeling of, to use a word that is discredited now much, but Louise, I'm sure you've thought a whole lot about joy, mm. you know? And it's discredited because it's, let me count the ways it's not serious. Um, let me throw in another thing. How about the world is a nightmare? The world is cruel, depraved, often inhumane. Uh, it is not the place of art or the contemplator of art to um, be joyful because to find that is to be unserious, to be escapist, to be naive. How about all of those things? And I think maybe in front of that picture that day, I began to understand that, um, that life is, uh, you know, um, that, that, ser that seriousness is not merely the stuff of gravity, that it's, or not made only of gravity, that there's seriousness and lightness, seriousness and pleasure go together. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've got a question um, to me about my um, experience of Helen as an artist which um, is a very uh, 
<laughs> Big question. Um, and the person asked, did I experience Helen's work as a young person? And if so, what did she think of it? And did that change? So just to give a little bit of context, um, uh, my father and Helen married when I was two and a half. Um, so um, my memories are of, of actually the, um, and I was born in 1955. So the memories of that coincide with this book are, are pretty, um, pretty vague at this point. Um, but in answer to that question, I, yes, um, my sister and I uh, both spent time in Helen's studio with her. We um, painted with her. She um, played uh, Chubby Checker and she played Barbara Streisand and we would dance together. And um, But the thing about Helen was, and my father were both, that they wanted us to make sure that they, they wanted us to have the freedom and experience the kind of freedom that they both experienced in the studio. And so we weren't allowed to have coloring books. We were given paper and crayon um, to just draw whatever we wanted. And of course that just created a, an urge to want um, coloring books. But aside from that, it was, um, that was a wonderful experience. Helen was very playful and, and we got that sense of her. Um, we didn't spend a ton of time in her studio and I was not an artist and didn't become an artist. So um, for me, the, it was, I experienced Helen in, in many other um, arenas. Um, there's another question. I hope that answers some of it. Um, there's another question. If we were well, to see the 19, this one's probably for you. If, if we were to see the 1950s as Helen's Bohemian period, what might that mean? Yeah, I think that would be to do with um, hanging out and, uh, you know, with other artists, um, the Cedar Tavern and things like that. And, uh, you know, perhaps before her marriage to your father, actually, you know, uh, might have been Helen's high bohemian period. Um, uh, I think she became more uh, literally uptown after their marriage. And uh, um, yes, yeah, sought to uh, maybe consolidate her reputation as, uh, um, you know, someone who uh, was a serious painter who was above all of that um, partying and so on that characterized her earlier years. Um, but I, Lise, I have a question for you or just something for us to think about together, which is just about this relationship of um, pain and trauma and, and lightness. I don't know if you wanna give your views about Helen's work in that regard, or, you know, I'm certainly happy to think about it too, but I do think that this is something that is, um, uh, you know, for me, it's an important thing about her work that it, again, it sort of teaches about how lightness is joy, pleasure, like are, are not to be scorned as um, having their own seriousness. I would agree with that. I think that it's hard to separate out that question from sort of a lot of assumptions that have been made about Helen over the years. And I think the primary one about her being, you know, coming from a wealthy established New York family and, um, and all that um, because of that, somehow she couldn't be a serious painter because she hadn't suffered enough. And I think one of the things that your book does is it talks about, um, um, some of the ways in which she did suffer and didn't have it easy, and that um, that actually in many ways it's it's sort of extraordinary that she created these light um, and and I don't mean not deep I mean light joyous paintings. Um, she also I think was very concerned about people considering her work um, beautiful and um, too easy to look at and felt that, um, that people didn't get it um, by just sort of saying, oh, that's, that's beautiful, that's pretty, I can hang that on my wall. 
And I think that um, there were lots of times she experimented with much darker paintings and much darker um, uh, uh, colors and shades and um, that, that she was very capable of um, rendering both sides of herself and sometimes both sides together, which is what I think of as, um, particularly as a psychologist, that it, it's, it's too easy, too easy to um, paint people in black and white and not see that most of us live in a gray area and that we have um, you know, all sorts of good and bad in us and um, can render all sorts of beautiful um, and ugly aspects of ourselves at, at different times. And one of the things that I really like about your book is your attempt to portray Helen in a much more three-dimensional manner. Yes, I, I, I respond very much to what you're saying about, as it were, the multicolors of a person's personality and that, you know, a Helen picture, as I think Frank O'Hara, the poet whose work I cited uh, and who understood her work very well, aptly put it, like, you know, Helen's work can be beautiful and ugly at the same time. It can be menacing and lyrical at the same time. It can be explosive and tender at the same time. And that to live with one of these pictures or to encounter one of them frequently is to be, is to sense exactly what you just said, Lise, which is, you know, that human beings are incredibly complicated. Unfortunately, we see in journalism or in art, often as a matter of just survival skills, because we, after all, don't we need our categories? We need our classifications. This person's a jerk, that person's wonderful, et cetera. We just make do with this shorthand of what human personality is like, you know? And, um, you know, Van Gogh was tortured. Uh, really, that was it, huh? Yeah, you know, um, and so on. And so, Helen's pictures are, you know, I'm tempted to say an education if it didn't make it sound so pedantic, you know, um, they're not there to give us a moral or a message. They're there to give us an experience. And the experience is finally an open one that gives us a basis for contemplation and a renewal of ourselves. You know, I think that's what it is. You know, I've, I don't know about you, Lise, but I've spent a lot of time in my life just thinking that different kinds of brooding darkness are basically where, where it's at, you know? Um, I, don't de I don't deny that I used to love to walk to play soccer in the mornings on the mall back in the 90s, uh, every Saturday and Sunday morning with the sunlight, um, even in the freezing cold, just loved it. I mean, but the darkness was the only thing, you know, and I've written so much about wars, for example, and tra traumas associated with wars. My parents met during the second world war. My mom, the Germans tried to kill her every night for four years, bombing London. Uh, it's taken me a while to realize, to kind of catch up to Helen and say, oh yeah, there's this thing where out of your pain or even separately from your pain, there's this other thing, it's called lightness, you know, and you don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to be afraid of it. And moreover, you need to be in it, in its presence because it's, 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 um, it's not only saving, it's not only affirming, it's, it delivers you into some state of being that you would not otherwise ever experience. And I think that in my belated, better late than never education, um, Helen's teaching me that. So we have a, a lot of questions that have come up. Um, one is, um, uh, was Helen's work spiritual or aesthetic in its origin and achievement or possibly more philosophical? I think you write a lot about that in the book. Um, mm -hmm. And Yeah, that's a, that's a sharp question. I, I guess to me, aesthetic, spiritual, and philosophical all wind up or are bound up together. But I, I can tell you that 
Helen had a very good friend, lifelong friend named Sonia Rudikoff, who was much more, I think we could say, of an intellectual and a philosopher and a sort of political person than Helen was. And they had an argument uh, early in the period the book covers concerning how one should respond to art. And Helen or Sonia said that, you know, basically you look at art intellectually, you know, what's it mean? What's it about? How does it engage with culture, politics, et cetera? And Helen said, no, you, you look at art because it delivers a charge, you know? Right. It's a painting is, you may have heard her say this, Lise, of course, I never knew Helen, so I, I only know from reading things in archives and so on, and from talking to people, but it's, uh, she would say, that painting is terrific, you know? And that, that, and it would be like a painting by Rubens or something like that, or Pollock, right? And so, that word terrific is aesthetic, spiritual, and philosophical for her. And uh, I think I'm just like a student of Helen's, you know, I'm just like learning like, oh yeah, that's right. In a way I can believe that. Yeah. And as you point out in the book that, that at that time art was a religion. And so that while Helen was not religious per se, um, certainly that generation of artists really felt that, that, creating something that was transcendent was, was, yeah, you know, what they were trying to do. Yeah. I think that's part of the book actually leads is to pose the question of what, what do we make now in our world, which, you know, to speak broadly is to do with um, skepticism and suspicion of arts powers to deliver us into some different state of being. What do we do with this art that comes from that time, which, as you've just said, was a time of the religion of art, like art was supposed to reveal something to you about yourself, about the world. What do we do now looking at these pictures? I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm I guess, naive enough, gullible enough to believe that um, that possibility of revelation is very much present still. There's another question about how Helen's work um, affected Motherwell's work and persona, if it if it did. Um, well, you might want to weigh in on that one, please. <laughs> well, I, I think that um, well, first of all, I would say that they were um, two people who uh, were. Um, I think I think you describe it as lonely souls who found each other, and um, their first evening together, sort of one of the first times they met was was after um, uh, where they just spent the whole night together talking, like as you said, like teenagers, mm -hmm. um, sort of sharing their view of the world and sharing their views of the world, their pains, their concerns, their questions about um, the world and themselves. And so there was a, quite an immediate connection between them. And, and my father probably was Helen, the love of Helen's life. I think that um, they um, often worked separately in separate studios. They always worked in separate studios, but in se sometimes in separate buildings, but they always um, or often talked about the work with each other. And you can see that there are influences. Um, you talk about some of them in your book about how my father's my father, who was known for his black and white paintings, um, started to use brighter, lighter colors in his painting. Whereas Helen's work, which had this kind of airiness to it, started to get um, a um, sort of heavier, kind of um, uh, denser feel on an even more concrete level, um, as we know, most of Helen's paintings were painted on unprimed canvas. When I curated a show of her work of the 60s, there was one canvas that had been primed and she had painted an enormous amount of work that summer 
Um, and we um, surmise, we don't know if it's true, but we surmise that she probably asked my father for a canvas and he always painted mm -hmm. on a prime canvas. So that may be sort of even the connection. But I know that my, my father was somebody who never um, cared about, he, he was quite messy and he didn't clean his brushes and Helen was always concerned about finances. And so she, she would often, I think, use the leftover paint that he had instead of letting it just get solid and the paintbrush getting stuck in it. Um, so there were certainly lots of ways. And if you look at their work um, side by side, you can certainly see other influences in terms of shapes and, and um, as I said, in color. Um, in terms of uh, personality, I, I mean, I think that um, Helen was somebody who was very social, um, in many ways, very light. She also had this dark side. My father tended to be much darker and um, much more, um, much less social. And I think Helen brought him out um, and, and was also very playful and funny and, and was, was someone who could make him, sort of bring him out of his own moroseness. Um, but I think she also could, empathize and and recognize the dark side because she had it too and um, certainly saw it in him and I'm, I'm sure she felt simpatico with him around that. Um, there's another question. Um, there's a question about her relationship with Clem, which I actually am going to suggest to the person to read the book because there's a lot about that in the book and there's been a lot written about it. Um, certainly a volatile um, relationship, but one that was what I will speak to about it is Helen had a, a tendency to go out with men who were considerably older than she was. And I think that um, certainly with Clem and certainly with my father. And, um, and I think that she was after her, her father died when she was 11, they were very, very close. Um, and I think that she really missed that kind of mentoring conversant um, relationship that she probably would have had a great deal of with her very um, intelligent father and sought out people who could teach her and sort of guide her and lead her. And I know there's a lot of conversation about Helen being um, um, very um, uh, sort of strategic and the people that she hung around with and particularly the people she dated and particularly with Clem and my father. But I think it, there was much more than that um, to the relationships that, you know, trying to fulfill something that was missing, but there was something about their intellectual capacity that was just very compelling for her. And she just wanted, she was like a sponge. She soaked things up. Um, uh, she loved intellectual conversation. Um, she loved being read to. My father would read to her. Um, and um, she took everything in. And we were talking about pointing out things, paintings that she would like. And she would say, that's very good. I can remember her doing that with the, uh, you know, T Magazine, which I don't think it call was called back then. But, you know, the yeah. she'd look at all the different um, outfits that people were wearing. And she would mm -hmm. point at one. She'd say, that is very good. Um, so she, uh, she had an amazing eye. Um, yeah, I will say about with Greenberg that, you know, there was a 20 year age difference in there between them. Um, Greenberg, uh, they met when Greenberg was 40 and she was 20. And, um, you know, Greenberg immediately introduced her to the art of Pollock which was transformative for Helen's practice. She went from making kind of Picasso style imitation of a highly skilled kind for sure, but nonetheless to the kind of pictures for which she is well known now, but also introduced her to the kind of highbrow leftist liberal uh, literary circles of New York also. And Helen absorbed things, yes, as Lee's is saying, but also understood that she needed some independence. And part of the complexity of their relationship is that is Helen's insistence upon her independence. Um, uh, also Helen being 
actually uh, a much better painter than Greenberg. Greenberg was also a painter and I think probably envied his girlfriend, her skill. Uh, so a very fraught relationship consisting of like many relationships, of course, with um, equal parts, dependence and uh, independence. So we have another convers uh, question. Um, if I remember correctly, many of Helen's paintings have oil stains, stains which spread around certain swaths of color, which were an unintended and even unwanted result of the particular paint that she used. How do you respond to these oil stains? Do they, for example, add to the depth of time the paintings convey, or do they unravel the sense of immediacy? Yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, there's one here at Stanford at the Anderson Collection, uh, which has exactly that problem. You know, um, they talk about the, the melancholy art. And what is the melancholy art? The melancholy art is that is that of art history itself, which in the words of my friend, Michael Ann Holly, is consists in studying artifacts from the past. Every painting in that sense is a ruin it is kind of a debris field in the making, as it were. So when I see Helen's pictures that have that trait, I try to understand, I, you know, I'm, I'm someone who likes going to see ruined castles, so, or ruins of all different kinds. So I, I can appreciate the age value of her pictures in that way, but I can also use my imagination to, I guess, um, look away from the oil stains or not regard them as even unintentionally in their halo-like qualities, um, additions to what she originally intended. But um, I mean, those are, those are two ways that I could respond to, to that change over time. Uh, I, I do think it's a little precious for us to expect that works of art remain unchanged. So um, there is probably an almost athletic procedure of viewing that works of art require of us where in seeing the Mona Lisa, for example, in addition to the athleticism involved in simply making one's way through the mosh pit of um, people with their cell phones, to be able to look at the crack, the cracking of the canvas like, or the cracking of the oil paint is itself um, an aesthetic experience that who knows is maybe richer than that of the so-called painting itself. So I think anytime we go into a museum, there's an interesting way of being that's entailed of being both alive to the historical datedness, if you like, or antiquity of what we study, what we see and then to the absolutely fresh sensation that anything can still deliver. I would, I would also add to that, that I think that the oil stains around the paintings, certainly of the ones that um, were in the show that I curated of Provincetown paintings, actually, I think may, created a kind of depth that was really mm -hmm. extraordinary and mm -hmm. made you feel aside from the size of the paintings that you were actually in the painting. You could, there, was, there was definitely depth, which is you know, an extraordinary feat in a painting that is two dimensional. Um, and part of that is obviously the paint soaking into the canvas, but part of that was really, and the layering of the paint, but it also had to do with the, the oil um, uh, around it, the oil stain around it. Also Helen in the 60s switched to acrylic paint and um, the, the benefit of that was it dried faster, but it also meant that she had to work faster in a way. I mean, that she had to, if you've ever seen any mm -hmm. film about Helen and her working, I mean, she's pouring huge amounts of paint onto canvas that is unprimed. She's moving it around with squeegees and sponges and, um, and it is a hugely physical activity, but um, the, the more astonishing part of it to my mind is just how, how um, both she knew when to stop. And secondly, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't fix something if she made a mistake. She had to just keep going or throw it away. And um, it, that um, 
is very different from, I think, many other artists where they can scrape the paint off the canvas and start again, or they can change something. I mean, when you when the paint is soaking into the canvas, there's nothing you can do. Um, yeah, so, it's a high wire act. And yeah. The yeah. stakes are not just making a successful painting, but making that which a successful painting um, portrays, which is life the feeling of life, right? So if you flub it, um, you've lost something, sort of like a poet trying to find the right phrase and they think they have it and then it's lost forever. And presumably, if you're a poet worth your salt with the disappearance of that phrase goes an aspect of life uh, that is gone forever, not just from you, but from any person who might happen to encounter your poem. There's a question here, was Helen a feminist by nature or necessity? And um, I'd love to answer that question. I think Helen would be horrified to be considered <laughs> a feminist at all. I think that she um, very much, she was, um, she, and yet she broke all sorts of barriers. Um, I think of the role models, women role models that I had, she was certainly um, right at the top of the list even though she didn't consider herself a feminist. I think Helen loved being, uh, Helen was very feminine. She really loved being a woman. She loved um, being partnered. She loved being in a relationship with someone. Um, she, um, and um, she, uh, um, particularly when it was going well, um, but she, um, uh, certainly did not, I think it's the same feeling that she had about being considered, you know, when people called her a woman artist, she felt somehow it was, it would, took away from her being an artist and that she was, um, that she really felt that she was equally capable and, um, uh, and able to do the work, serious work to make that her life's work. And, um, and so the model that I got as a young woman um, watching her was that you didn't define, I, although I did consider myself a feminist, you didn't define yourself that way. You just went out and did what you felt compelled to do. You tried it and sort of her thing about risk-taking, Helen was very conservative in many ways, but in her work, she really took risks. Um, unlike many of the abstract expressionists, she was not a big drinker. She didn't take drugs. She, you know, lived a fairly um, sort of typical life um, in in the sense of um, you know family and and friends and that kind of thing. She wasn't wild, but she was willing to take enormous risks in the studio and um, and enormous risks within her career. And I think that's where she would be considered a feminist today. Um, but I don't think she ever considered herself one and probably thought it was a bad word. Um, we have um, several other comments. These are ones that really you address in your book. So um, probably good for you. One is how did the New York City art world influence Helen? Yes, well, um, after she met Greenberg, uh, he took her to see a show of Jackson Pollock's drip paintings, the very large ones, Autumn Rhythm and so on. And um, that was astounding to Helen. This was in 1950. And it was then that she felt the possibilities of an art that would be truly free and the next summer can find her on the Hampton Dunes swearing a youthful pledge of eternal faith along with the artist Larry Rivers who was her age to Pollock and to his, um, his untrammeled creativity and fearless um, freedom. And it's no question that Pollock opened things up for her though Helen's work is its own, is unto itself and is doesn't look anything like Pollock's, but he taught her about painting on the ground, painting on unprimed, unprimed canvas, et cetera. Uh, so that's, that's a big thing. And 
tied up with that is the relation to Greenberg, who again was um, a kind of brilliant mentor, co-conspirator, friend, and also like a very difficult person uh, for her to be around. And another question for you, Alex, um, can you talk about your research process in writing the book? What sources did you explore? I spent a lot of time at, in Princeton, New Jersey at the Sonia Rudikoff archive where uh, uh, the archive of her papers, uh, that is uh, Helen wrote very detailed letters to her friend Sonia and uh, Often those letters helped determine for me the days on which I would write because certain of those days, for example, February 12, 1954, August 2nd, 1955, were just very deep, dense days in terms of the letter to, um, to Sonia. Also, the Getty in Los Angeles, where Clement Greenberg's papers are. And, you know, last but not least, Helen Frankenthaler Foundation in New York and the people there have been so extraordinarily helpful to me and encouraging to me in my project. And um, there's a wealth of material there. So um, we have another question. I'm struck by what you say about Helen's concern. I guess this was to me initially about Helen's concern that her work would be seen as just beautiful. Helen herself was a beautiful young woman. How might that have played into how she was perceived and how she thought she would be perceived? Well, um, I think when Mountains and Sea uh, was first exhibited in early 1953, and this is the painting that as many of you know is at the National Gallery in Washington and has been for many years, uh, it was, derided basically by a critic as um, pale and pleasant, um, basically decorative. And I think it's fairly easy to hear the gendered implication of that, that um, a young woman makes a kind of decorative picture. And this gets at what we were saying before about if you like the dangers of making things that are beautiful. Uh, and then the gendered criticism that that, that making entails. Uh, again, I give Helen such credit for just basically ignoring that. Was she hurt? Was she depressed by that kind of criticism? Yes, she was. I mean, who wouldn't be? Did she suffer a kind of um, depression coincidentally or not with that show from which no work sold. Um, yeah, she was very depressed. She spent a lot of time sleeping. Uh, but, you know, was her resolve challenged? Did she ever think maybe that wasn't a good painting? No, <laughs> never, never, ever, you know? And I, I get that about Helen. You know, we say like she was a real artist or something like that. Well, sure, she was a real artist, but I mean, she was, she was born to do this because just what I just said, the, the combination of like, never, I will never do what you say or what you think I should do. I mean, she, even as a high school student, she didn't like it when her very accomplished teacher would make marks, correction marks on her picture, right? Because it's like, this is my picture, not your picture. You know, show it to me on a separate piece of paper, what I need to do. Don't, don't mark on my picture. Uh, that, that on the one hand, and then on the other hand, this capacity to be, to feel things deeply, to be wounded, to be damaged. Um, but somehow to, in ways that my friend there in DC, John Blee, who knew Helen quite well in the 1970s, has helped me to see so beautifully with Helen's work, um, somehow this capacity to defeat the darkness, you know, Lise. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, here I am, I've never even seen you, Lise, until today. Like we always have just talked on the phone and you, by the way, just to shout out, like such a great, so kind um, and so thoughtful and so wise about 
all this stuff you've told me and you know i know i thank you in the book but that's from the heart i mean um i think we have a lot of things in common <laughs> and uh i just at least from my end of the phone i always felt like this is like a really beautiful i just thought our conversations were really beautiful and um but you know maybe one source of that beauty is that you know seeing like little ripples of water on the beach or something like that that's me you know are you know seeing seashells or the stars in the sky it's not nothing you know it's not nothing it could take your breath away with how beautiful that is and how important how life-saving that kind of thing is one of the um audience members wrote a comment quoting Joseph Albers saying, thus art is not an object, it's an experience. And that's how that person experience, perceives Helen's work. I think that's true. I mean, I think that the thing that Helen um, really brings in her work is this experience of life. And sometimes it's joyful, sometimes it's not. But there is a way in which you experience her experience of it and experience your own experience of it, which mm. I think is what makes art great. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. I mean, I, I think that's something that's hard for people to, 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 to kind of figure out. I know it can be for me too. Namely, the artist makes something, if you like, narcissistically, like for themselves out of their own experience. And yet, does so finally in a generous spirit as a gift. And when I think of that is a gift to the rest of us because we recognize something in, in it that's true for us too. And I think um, maybe the real sort of dilemma or possibility for us now is in our world where I think you know art is to do a lot with the first person raw and unvarnished, you know, I experienced this, I felt this, it was my time to perceive this, etc. It's a little bit hard to work back from that to this notion of uh, a more religious sense of art, where it's like, I had this experience, and I have to share it with you, because I feel it's your experience, too. It's right. that audacity of the personal to say that what is true for me might be true for you too. That is what we miss in our discourse, in our, in our public sphere now. And I know as a teacher, I'm always trying to teach to that, to that possibility, that possibility of connection. And Helen's work embodies that for me. She's my teacher in that way. It brings us back to our own connection, which I also appreciate and just wanted to say thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Um, we have had some really wonderful conversations, <clears throat> both about the work, the, the, your book and otherwise. Um, and mm -hmm. it, it's been, uh, we ended up sharing a lot and I think that it's been um, a, a quite nice uh, relationship and, and experience. So I thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome, Liz. I'm going to take us back to Liz and um, thank everybody um, who has participated in this and um, meaning the audience, thank you very much for checking in. Liz? Absolutely. This was such a wonderfully engaged audience. It isn't always like this. Um, so indeed, seconding what Liz says, thank you all so much. Thank you, Lise and Alexander. Um, please do buy the book at Politics and Prose fierce poise and um, stay well and stay well read. Thank you all. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.